paní Lilian Růhe, která vystudovala dějiny umění a archeologii na univerzitě v Nýmechen a svoji doktorskou práci věnovala malíři portrétu Kristianu Seiboldovi. Šířejí se věnuje problematice středoevropského portrétu, přičemž publikovala také několik studií k portrétní galerii knížete Jana Adama Questenberka ze zámku Jaroměřice nad Rokytnou. Na Lilian je pro nás takovým opravdu pokladem, neboť se aktivně účastní průzkumu vlastně uměleckého materiálu v České republice. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction and also thank you so much for the invitation to this really exciting congress. Um, I hope you can understand my English. It's not perfect, but I will do my best. It's better than my Czech language. Uh, researching the Viennese court painter Christian Seibold, I unexpectedly, uh, unexpectedly discovered Peter Brandl through an enigmatic work that once had been ascribed to Seibold. The second work of this re reading is a portrait of an unknown, unknown aristocrat by Victor Olandicus Philip Christian Bentham, and other challenging um, identification. The painting in the center has long been known as a creation of Jan Kupetsky. According to Ed Edward Safarik's Kupetsky monography from 1928, Max Friedlander ascribed it to Christian Seibold. When comparing it with one of Seibold's work that Friedlander may have known, we notice significant similarities in style, costume treatment, and even the model's physiognomy, which is, by the way, an exception within Seibold's repertoire of faces. And please remember this. But the interplay of dynamic postures and a theatrical lighting are also prominently evident in the artistry of both painters. Friedlander's attribution to Seibold nevertheless lacks persuasiveness for multiple reasons. The narrativity and composition do not match Seibold's styles, style, Moreover, the figure in the background and its execution are untypical for Seibold's oeuvre. In my opinion, we should dismiss the possibility that Seibold is its potential painter. In uh, 2004, Safarik's grandson and namesake published it in his Kupetsky monography, as is seen by Jakob Samuel Beck, which you are uh, looking at at this moment, in the early style of either Kupetsky or Brandl. His attribution to the two generations older Beck nevertheless excluded Peter Brandl as its author. Brandl's genre figures on and, like those in Chateau Jaroma Rosice, share a similar theatrical inclination, while strong angles of bodies and heads also recur in his paintings. In the female part of the pair, we observe a comparable shading in the eye socket. Both the distinctive nose and full lips of her smoking counterpart appear to belong to the same model as the protagonist in question. And their heads reflect each other's shape, also the shape of uh, Brandl's uh, self-portrait, uh, by the way. The upward gaze of the holy and discreet character mirrors a similar serene calm, while the left sides of their faces display an interplay of shadows that subtly defines their shapes. Other motifs, such as the gesture, are significant within Brandl's work, including his self-portraits, where the Komput Digitis gesture, a sign as a sign of the artist liberalis, even has become an attribute of his art. Moreover, we recognize the distinctive gesture made by the figure in the foreground and from one of his altarpieces. Other motives, uh, sorry, the cursely uh, detailed background figure is a familiar element in Brandl's work as well, as these examples illustrate. 
in my view, this work evidently represents the artistic essence of Peter Brando. Now, let's look into the actual scene. According to the collector's restorer, and this is very important, the green color of the garment is anticipated to transform into a bright white after cleaning. But despite its poor condition, efforts must be made to verify the current title. Since its first publica publication in 1913, it is titled, as shown on the slide, and still today recorded as a female fortune teller predicting the future to a young man. We know this theme very well from genre painting, but this scene's composition is unconventional in respect to the pictorial tradition of it. Usually associated with low life, it often depicts a gathering of well-dressed young men or maiden with, who have their fortune told by an old woman or a gypsy. While these scenes sometimes involve robbery, that is certainly not the case here. And is the half-length figure in the foreground male or female, as the title suggests. The drapery lusciously cascading over a white-brimmed hat resembles the files commonly associated with elderly women, like in the scene once in the Cairnian collection, which was familiar to Brandel at least since 1721. These kinds of vile-like head coverings frequently appear in the depiction of old women, often explained as an attribute of their modest and pious lives. Of course, art theory explicitly tried to paint them with covered skin and hair. This becomes particularly evident through the stages of women's life characterizing the fully covered figures on the right, being above 17 years old. However, Brandel's foreground figure, unlike a typical, like the typical portrayal of elderly woman, women, has a smooth face, suggesting more useful. Old women are all often portrayed with masculine physiognomy, featuring a prominent hooked nose, like in Brandel's case, and a strong chin, as is clear from last month's depictions. And last one was a teacher of Rembrandt. Um, uh, in a genre painting, the combination of elderly women and, like in Brandel's work, covered heads and open books, symbolize a range of virtues and vices, which is often explored by Rembrandt's pupil, Nicolas Maas. The capito velato, or covered head, generally signifies piousness, or indicating a priestly role, either male or female, as already seen in Roman art. Early modern history paintings similarly depict biblical women. A rare representation of the prophetess Hulda in this context is intriguing, still assuming Brandel portrayed a woman. Hulda, consulted by Josiah's delegation about a rediscovered holy book during the temple's reconstruction, confirmed the foretold disasters due to disobedience to the Lord's rules. This pivotal moment in Hulda's narrative may res resonate with the presence of the book and the shocked emotions of the recipients, but is a likely candidate, is she a likely candidate for a new title? Through hard, though hard, hard to discern, the background figure with wide opened eyes and mouth, his hands towards, towards the head, is reacting strongly on what is communicated in the foreground. Facial expressions and gestures were integral part of Baroque storytelling, 
guiding viewers through the narrative's most dramatic moments. Deciphering their meaning involves exploring contemporary, uh, contemporary publications on body language, such as Charles Le Brun's Expression des Passions de l'âme, Gerard de Lares's Conventions for conveying emotions in his Groot Schilderboek, and especially insights from John Bulwer on chirology and chironomy, which enables us to enhance our understanding of gestures. Our figure can be inter interpreted as shocked, obviously. Among the three gestures, from Bulwer that are related to Brandel's foreground, foreground figure, the top one closely corresponds, most closely corresponds. Its Latin caption translates to with which some begin. This could be interpreted as a sign of the commencement of speech, suggesting the communication of something significant. In a religious scene like the birth of Mary, this gesture appears fitting, enhancing its interpretation as a prefiguration of the birth of Christ, considering Christ is analogue to the Word, according to the Gospel of John. Yet, deciphering the gesture's meaning in the context of the work in question poses a challenge. Could it be a man? A theme from the Old Testament that may meet the criteria of prophecy, the gesture and a shock reaction of the recipient is the seldom depicted prophecy of Isaiah to King Ahaz, involving the virgin birth of Emmanuel, who is identified with Christ. Isaiah's prophecy concludes with the threat of disaster to King Ahaz, his people and his ancestral house providing ample reason for a shocked reaction, of course. If it indeed can be interpreted as the sign of Emmanuel, it alludes to Brundle's birth of Mary from 1701 through this gesture. The backward tilted, tilted head finds precedent in an Italian Josiah, while beardless Josiah could be traced back to Michelangelo. The absence of a crown, however, suggests that th this theme is not visualized. In my view, the foreground figure is a man wearing a white veil draped over a broad-brimmed hat. I couldn't find similar combinations in either genre or history painting. Nevertheless, 17th and 18th century interior prints of the Amsterdam synagogue depict a comparable outfit. Details of Jan Veenhuizen's engraving show praying men wearing contemporary clothes and a hat or tricorn covered with a Jewish talit or prayer shawl. Only 10 years later, Romain de Hoge published his version of the interior of the newly built synagogue with equally dressed men, as you can see. In 1725, the engraver Bernard Picard illustrated a widely disseminated monumental work on world religions. Similar to the previous examples, he depicted this dress code of Amsterdam Sephardic Jews. Not only explaining rituals or rules about kosher food, this book also explores historical anti-Semitism anti and confirms an image of Jews built on stereotypes, which would be rightfully considered unacceptable nowadays. Could this have been Brandel's source for portraying a pious Jew or even a biblical prophet? One thing is sure, this outfit is, uni is a unique departure from the contemporary clothing canon of biblical protagonists. Regardless of its exact subject, 
should this scene be approached as a biblical narrative rather than a genre painting? If one opts for the latter, as I do, Brandl might have aimed to satirize Judaism by painting the essence of fear-mongering false prophecies fueled by the contemporary rise of false prophets and messiahs within Jewish communities. A topic I won't delve into any further at this moment. Although Brandel's, Brandel's painting certainly does not fall within a definition of a portrait, in this scenario it could be interpreted similarly to the mock religious scenes and portraits of protagonists uh, showing uh, inconvenient paradoxes, um, exemplified by Sir Francis Dashwood in the UK, Count von Gotter in Germany and Vienna, and Count Tessin's Praying Nun, uh, painted by Martin van Meijten. Witty and entertain uh, entertaining in its time. Stylistically, it well compares to Brandl's other uh, genre pieces, though I think it dates from the late uh, 1720s, early 1730s. Given the absence of an established pictorial uh, tradition, this genre scene must be regarded as an artistic invention by the painter. And given Picard's and others' despicable stereotypes of Jews, should Seibold's idiosyncratic man-eating a pig's uh, stomach also be uh, reinterpreted as Jew eating a pig's stomach and be classified in this mock category of paradoxes. Coming to the second work, hitherto known as a portrait of an unknown nobleman painted by Philip Christian Bentham. About 1700, Roger de Peel taught in his theory regarding portraiture it was appropriate to ide idealize portraits of women and young men. On the other hand, he, ex he emphasized to faithfully depict heroes and individuals of rank. The capturing of their unique traits, whether beautiful or imperfect, is crucial these portraits are destined for posterity. Consequently, he urged artists to accurately portray, especially imperfections, to convey these rulers' genuine individual features. Of course, he additionally advised considering good air and grace for an enhanced portrayal. Within these parameters, it's our job to identify sitters who have lost their names and so their true identity during the centuries. My knowledge of this oval portrait in the collection of the Counts of Kolovrat was until recently limited to this rather sad black and white image. In Beata Lyman's monography, it is considered a co collaborative effort between Brandel and Bentham. Because Christian Seibold was one of Emperor Charles VI's court painters, I initially and instinctively uh, perceived it as a potential portrait of this ruler. Intimately portrayed in a Japon rock, devoid of regalia or typical symbols of his power, this informality struck me as ordinary and unseen. Little did I suspect that it would pose such a challenge to ascertain whether it is indeed the emperor or not. Thus, I invite you to join me in exploring the preliminary result of this research in progress. Even though the position of the head is in three-quarter profile and slightly tilted backwards, you might observe as I did, physiognomic resemblances, such as the rounded, droopy eyes with the outward drooping lower eyelids and the slightly curved but flat nose that concludes in a downward po pointing bulbous tip and, also remarkable for his face, the absence of a continuous nasolabial fold, that's the fold uh, here. Um, 
the well-defined philtrum, that's the, the part between the nose and the upper lip, between his nose and upper lip, along with the shape and curvature of both uh, the lips and the transition to the chin, all appear to belong to the same individual. It, individual. You might agree or not. Then, a newly photographed image of the portrait arrived, which showed the face less long and rounder in its shape than usual. Another portrait of this emperor, allegedly also painted by Bentham, is in Poland. Although signed, it does not show a similar style, so I wonder if it is by Bentham at all. Also known as made by Bentham is this portrait of Charles VI in Austria. The stylistic clo closeness to the of the face to Franz von Stampert's in idiom would support Jan's uh, theory that Bentham closely collaborated with Stampert in Vienna, Vienna. But the three Benthams have nothing to do with each other, in my view. Most of the emperor's portraits display a deviate, de deviating interpretation of his facial features. This is not very out of the ordinary, as is shown by the next examples, which all portray the same study or template, executed by different masters and or their workshops. Some are strongly, strongly idealized, some apparently not, which in full accordance with art theory concerning ruler's portraits. I also found it plausible that the portrait of Charles was part of this series in Rijnov, especially given another portrait resemble, resembling his brother and predecessor, Emperor Joseph I, when compared to a widely distributed engraving. The identification of the latter portrait is complicated by the presence of the Maltese cross, an order I could not associate with Joseph I, but which out, uh, which will root ha rule out his identity. During my recent visit and close-up photography, I was surprised, surprised to find a man with blue eyes, contrary to Charles' documented brown eyes. This didn't trouble me excessively, as another royal portrait, Rotary's depiction of Queen Maria Josepha, renowned for her eyes also exists in a version with dark brown eyes. Seibold evidently shared the confusion regarding the color of her eyes. This fact confirms once more that painters often work from templates and royal sitters only seldom pose. And I'm, I'm finished. The close-up also reveals re retouches at the right brow, interrupting its shape and corrections or pentimenti, along the jawline, which might have changed the shape of the face profoundly. Every portrait specialist knows plenty of examples of identities lost in noble collections, who soon became adoptees in the family, as this early portrait Charles illustrates. Alternative identities, members of the Colorad branches, did not convince me so far. Until a comparable portrait turns up, Charles VI could be an option. I am open to all your suggestions. Many thanks for your attention.